So we have just seen how proteins can be transported to nucleus. We have said that proteins, even if they're fully folded, they can still enter the nucleus with the help of certain receptors. That is not the case with the other organelles. Proteins, folded proteins cannot enter other organelles. They have to be in a linear form to be able to enter the organelles. We will discuss, first of all, the example of mitochondria, and then we'll also talk about endoplasmic reticulum. So let's talk about the mitochondrial protein transport. First of all, let's look at the mitochondrial structure. We have already talked about it. Mitochondria is a double membrane enclosed organelle. It has an outer membrane and an inner membrane. The outer membrane is relatively more permeable. It allows small ions, for example, to enter. However, the inner membrane is more stringent in what it allows to enter. We have already said that mitochondria contains its own DNA, ribosome, and other components required for the protein synthesis. However, most of the proteins are encoded by the nucleus in the cell and imported from the cytoplasm. So that is a little strange, of course. We have said that mitochondria evolved as small organisms which were engulfed by a large phagocytic cell. So these small organisms must have their own complete set of genes which allowed them to live independently. And in this case, we are saying that the mitochondria are dependent upon gene products and these genes are present in the cell nucleus. So how does that happen? Of course, these mitochondria were independently living organisms, but over the course of evolution, mitochondrial genes, they moved into the cellular genome and therefore now mitochondria cannot live independently if they were taken outside the cell. They are dependent upon many proteins that are coded by the host cell, if you will. Uh, so mitochondria need to import many proteins. Of course, as you can see, there's two subcompartments in the mitochondria. The inner matrix space, here I will point this out. This is internal matrix space and the inner membrane space, the space between the two membranes. So the proteins that are specifically present in the internal matrix space, which is right here, and the proteins which are specifically present in the space between the two membranes, the outer membrane and the inner membrane. Proteins imported into the matrix of the mitochondria are usually taken up from the cytosol within seconds or minutes of their release from the ribosome. Mitochondrial proteins are first fully synthesized as precursor proteins in the cytosol and then translocated into mitochondria by a post-translational mechanism. It is in contrast with when we talk about uh, the ER transport, it contrasts with the ER mechanism. We will talk about that later. Mitochondrial precursor proteins have a signal sequence at their end terminus. So there's a sequence of amino acids at the end terminus of proteins that are imported into the mitochondria and which is, however, removed soon after these proteins have entered the matrix space of the mitochondria. The signal sequence is both necessary and sufficient for import of proteins that contain them. People have done genetic engineering experiments and they have linked this signal sequence, mitochondrial signal sequence, to proteins that normally don't enter in mitochondria. These genetically engineered proteins, which are normally present in cytosol, if they are tagged with a signal sequence, now they will be imported into the mitochondria. Vice versa, if their mitochondrial protein, if using genetic engineering techniques, if that signal sequence is removed from these proteins, these proteins will no longer be able to enter mitochondria. So signal sequence is again necessary and sufficient for imports of the proteins into the mitochondria. Matrix signal sequences have propensity to fold into an amphithetic alpha helix. What I mean by that is that this helix has two faces which, are, which have different characteristics. 
positively charged residues cluster on one side of the helix while uncharged and hydrophobic residues are clustered on the opposite side. I'll show you a diagram of this. This configuration rather than a precise amino acid sequence is what is recognized by specific receptor proteins that initiate protein translocation. So the receptor proteins present on the surface of the mitochondria on the outer membrane, these receptor proteins recognize this, this characteristic of this alpha helix, which has two faces. One is hydrophobic and one is positively charged. So it is more of this, this characteristic of this helix rather than specific amino acids that is recognized by this particular receptor. And you can see the sequence of these amino acids on the bottom of the screen. Here's another view of that sequence. A signal sequence for mitochondrial protein is present here. So you can see this. Here, the red amino acid residues are basically the ones which are the positively charged. So arginine, methionine, arginine, lysine, arginine. And non-polar residues are coded with the yellow color. So these are the hydrophobic amino acids, which are shown in yellow. And as you can see, when they fold and form helix, yellow color is on one side and the red is on the other side of the alpha helix. So this basic property of this helix is recognized by the receptor proteins present on the outer surface, present in the outer membrane of the mitochondria. Another thing I would like to re-emphasize is mitochondrial precursor proteins that do not fold, they stay straight uh, in an unfolded configuration after they have been synthesized and whereas when we talk about when we talked about nuclear import we said even the folded proteins could enter the nucleus